morning everybody and uh, it's also see how the interaction yeah, happens yeah, yeah. so going over to hyderabad uh, there was a question yes, the basic definition of static pressure and total pressure what is the difference between static pressure and total pressure okay what is the difference between static pressure and total pressure Sometimes I wonder we are teaching fluid mechanics or heat transfer. So that's what Professor Gayatunde was saying. We should have actually had first fluid mechanics rather than heat transfer. Anyway, the question is what is static pressure and what is total pressure? What is static pressure? The name static itself suggests that something is static. So this is what Professor Anderson gives in his textbook, fluid mechanics textbook, not fluid mechanics, aerodynamics. If I sit on a fluid particle, and keep moving along with the fluid particle, whatever pressure I feel, that is static pressure. But while I am moving, I am going to have the kinetic component also along with me, that is dynamic pressure, that is rho v squared by 2, that is dynamic component. If I add this static component of the pressure, that is the static pressure, and the dynamic component, that is dynamic pressure, then I am going to get the total pressure. So this is static and dynamic pressure. Static pressure, if you still are not convinced with my answer, I had told on the other day itself, what, how do we feel pressure? Feeling pressure is to go to its extreme end where there is no pressure. When do you don't have pressure? In vacuum. You evacuate a chamber, nothing is there. Why no, no pressure is there in the vacuum? Because there are no molecules. If there are molecules, there is intermolecular collision. Because of the intermolecular collision, there is pressure. So, I always feel the pressure as the collision of the molecules. When there is no molecule, then there is no pressure because they cannot collide with anyone else, anyone because there is no molecule. So, that is static pressure. Thermodynamic pressure, whatever Professor Gaitunde has taught us, is thermodynamic pressure. That is the static pressure. Okay? There is no difference between thermodynamic pressure and static pressure. Thermodynamic pressure and static pressure are same. Only when we add the kinetic component to it, that is the dynamic component to it, that is rho v squared by 2, I get the total pressure to the static pressure. Is that okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we'll go over to NIT, uh, NIT in Tirichirapalli now. Sir, in the case of flow through the duct, what is the correlation for Nusselt number, for laminar and turbulent flow, for entry length, other than circular duct, okay. such as rectangular okay. channel? Okay, good question. Actually, in case of a duct in developing flow, what is the correlation for friction factor and Nusselt number? Yes, we have not covered this in, in non-circular geometries. Why non-circular? Even circular we have not covered. Because this is a developing length, usually we cover this portion in uh, PG, that is postgraduate advanced heat transfer course. It's a good question. But we cannot, we, there, is, there is analytical solution for that. It's not that there is only experimental result. There are correlations available. Please put up this. This is what is called as grades problem. G-R-A-E-T-Z problem, grades problem. We have not covered this in our course. Please put up this question in the Moodle. We will come up with the answer for that. There are correlations as a function of X by D. In fact, if you, if you want to see the correlation directly, it will look li something like this. Nusselt number equal to some constant plus some constant upon RE into X by D. So, and next is again constant upon RE squared into X by D whole squared. So the correlation is essentially a function of Reynolds number and the location where we are interested in getting the heat transfer coefficient. So we will put up this result definitely. But usually for a UG heat transfer, we don't teach this. This is beyond the scope of the UG heat transfer. Definitely if you put up this question, we will put up this answer in the Moodle. Okay. We will now go over to St. Joseph College, Kerala. In the case of okay. high Reynolds number flow, is it uh, in the case of uh, for uh, flow or flat plate, is it possible that right from the leading edge the turbulent boundary left starts? Yes, good question. For a flow over a flat plate, we always study that initially there is laminar boundary layer, then we have transitional boundary layer, then we have turbulent boundary layer. Is it possible that can I get the boundary layer becoming turbulent right from the leading edge? Yes, it is possible. How can I do that? That is how people do, that is they put a tripping wire initially itself so that my boundary layer becomes turbulent. Or I can, if I take a rough plate, right from the beginning, it's going to become turbulent. That is when I say rough, you imagine that sand grains have been poured on the rough plate 
and then immediately that provided that sand grain roughness thickness is greater than the laminar sublayer thickness which is what we have been insisting right from the beginning if you have broken that viscous sublayer because of the presence of the laminar because of the presence of the sand grains then definitely my boundary layer is going to become turbulent right from the leading edge thank you very much uh, let's go over to uh, jntu hyderabad Sir, in a pool boiling curve, the curve declines from C to D, and then it increases from D to E. So, why is it so? Can you explain, sir? And yeah, one I more love. question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you explain yeah, the I Wilson love. plot in yeah, heat yeah. exchangers? Thank you. Wilson plot. Okay, Wilson plot. I have explained during yesterday's heat exchangers. But still, if you think that we need to answer that, please put this in Moodle. i will answer that but essentially wilson plot is used to measure the heat transfer coefficient on the tube side keeping the annulus side heat transfer coefficient very very high that is the essence of wilson plot but i will answer that in greater detail through your moodle question but what was your question will you please repeat we could not follow that for now i am flashing the boiling curve with reference to boiling curve will you please ask your question Declining from C to D and uh, increasing from uh, D to E. Okay. So okay. why is it so? Can you explain? Okay. C to D, there is a decrease in the heat transfer coefficient, and D to E, why is it? It is increasing. Okay. So what is happening? Word of caution. Please look at the scale. It is a logarithmic scale. X-axis is delta T, which is increasing from about hundred at Leiden first point to about thousand. So heat transfer coefficient is not increasing. what we are saying is that the he, the the wall temperature has increased suddenly and this transition region which we have shown so nicely by c to d line you cannot capture it so nicely you will in fact it is a region of oscillatory flow so you will have heat transfer very good at an instant very poor heat transfer when vapor is in contact at an next instant so this line is just drawn for convenience in fact you will not be able to get such a nice curve at all okay so it is heat transfer is not heat transfer is not increasing or anything like that what we are saying is this part of the curve d to e has been obtained uh, by this concept of uh, uh, this film boiling as you are making the film uh, as the film is becoming thicker and thicker your heat transfer is going to become poorer and poorer okay but uh, when the film becomes thicker the temperature of the gas or temperature of this uh, vapor inside the film will also be higher so radiation heat transfer will become higher so that is a cause for heat transfer and uh, increase there so it is not two phase anymore it will become single phase but radiation can contribute to even up to 60% of the heat transfer because of the high temperature okay remember for radiation it is t wall to the power of 4 so its contribution is very high okay four and no uh thank you very much we'll move over to a uh, phd college coimbatore which has to ask a question sir in turbulency measurements i already told you the anemometer used to measure the turbulency uh, in heating conditions in no heating conditions whether you use the anemometer the question is for turbulence measurements we have always mentioned that we can use hot wire anemometer but can i use uh, hot wire anemometer for heated conditions what all examples i have given is all for unheated condition that is what you mean perhaps is that if i am having fluid flowing it is a cold fluid that is it is just maintained at ambient condition and we are doing the experiments at under adiabatic conditions that is there is no heat transfer yes that's a good question under heated condition what will happen the fluid temperature is varying from one location to another location so it is yes it is difficult to measure under heated condition because the fluid temperature is varying from one location to another location why the basic principle over which this hot wire anemometer is working is cta that is constant temperature anemometer it is called as why because the temperature of the wire is maintained constant that means what we are worried about is the temperature between temperature difference between the wire and the fluid but from location to location if the temperature difference between the wire and the fluid is varying then my calibration characteristics of the wire are going to vary why because my calibration i have done between wall temperature of let us say 400 degrees wire temperature of 400 degrees celsius and a fluid temperature of 30 degrees celsius if the fluid temperature is continuously varying my calibration characteristics are going to vary so if the fluid temperature is varying that is under heated condition 
it is difficult to use constant temperature anemometer. For that there are high, high end techniques that is either particle image velocimetry or laser interferometry we have to employ. Is that okay? Okay sir. So next question is conductivity based. So conductivity varies from hardness, hardness of the material. So we know. Uh, do you have any relationship between the HRC that is a like hardness versus conductivity? Okay, question is whether thermal uh, hardness, thermal conductivity varies with the hardness. Are you aware of any correlation for thermal conductivity with hardness? Honestly, I don't know. I never even thought that hardness would matter the thermal conductivity so far. But you please put up this question. We will try to see that and come back to you. I don't know. Really, let me think aloud. Why do you think that hardness would affect my thermal conductivity? Thermal conductivity is the <coughs> arrangement of the molecules inside my body. So why should hardness affect the thermal conductivity? Anyway, you put this question, let me answer by thinking or searching the material. Can, no I, can I add yes. something as a, as a completely non-thermal or unthermal expert? Uh, wouldn't hardness also depend to a large extent on the arrangements of molecule anyway? So, in which case, whatever arrangement of molecules you think is responsible for conductivity, by implication at least, yes. the hardness should have some role to play. Correct. Because hardness and the molecular arrangement should somehow be related. I, I do not know, I am just speculating. Uh, would my friend uh, uh, from remote center like to comment on this observation? And then I will ask him again uh, to reflect back. Over to you. Okay, sir. So ne next question is, in heat transfer and thermodynamic subjects, sir, we have lots of assumption. Okay, sir. Uh, but in real and practical case, okay. not like that. <laughs> One some minute, sir. Real and practical case is not like that. So how can believe? Uh, how can? Uh, what is the reliability of the subject? See, one thing is regarding your first question. Diamond and graphite are both carbon. Okay. But I am sure both of uh, both of them have different hardness. I don't know the numbers, but diamond is used to cut metals, so diamond is harder than graph, uh, graphite. So uh, there, the structure is going to be different. Not that I am an expert in all these things, but thermal conductivity also is going to be different. different so definitely. if you go to a from a point of view of lattice structure, etc., I think we will be able to understand this. We can post it to our colleagues in metallurgy department and try to get some answers for it. Second thing related to assumptions, I feel it is actually very philosophical, okay. See, not being able to solve a problem is not an option, so you have to solve a problem. What is the accuracy with which you want to solve a problem, that is what is going to drive uh, our solution methodology. Now to have a solution methodology, we need to have some tools and those tools are what we are getting to see from basic courses and even applied courses so that, uh, to that matter. So what we teach in colleges, though it has a lot of inherent assumptions, it is actually developing the thought process more than the solution technique. Okay. So the thought process is how do I, how do I put this problem in a mathematical form so that I can make it tractable, otherwise no problem will have any solution. Okay, so with that, that is the basic. Let me add on to this. I don't definitely, I don't agree that what all we are, what all we have studied yesterday. Also, I made this statement in the evening. One of the students asked me this. We, I made a statement that what all we studied should we be throwing it to garbage because it is not, uh, not nearing to real life. No, I don't agree with you at all. See, my student had sat here and attended. My PhD student sat here and attended, uh, at least for the convection portion because he was little jittery about convection. The question for him is, if I take a body and put it in a fire, what is the, what are the modes of the heat transfer important? All this while, you don't believe all this while, we were considering radiation and convection. What was I considering for convection? I was considering forced convection. When I, when he saw this Grashof upon Reynolds number whole squared here, and midnight day before yesterday, we got a paper which was published by BARC Mysore which had taken natural convection. So then we asked ourselves the question whether I should take the natural convection or forced convection. Yesterday evening, we sat down and calculated GR by RE squared. To our horror, we found that actually it is natural convection. Had I not known all these fundamentals about Grashof number, Reynolds number, and the velocity boundary layer, thermal boundary layer, and convective heat transfer, I would not have designed in modeling 
how much amount of heat is received by my body because of fire. So to identify which mode of heat transfer is dominant over the other, I can only decide that if I am strong in fundamentals. If I am not strong in fundamentals, I am not strong in applied research. Applied research feeds into fundamental research. Fundamental research feeds into applied research. These two talk each other. That is, these two are complementary to each other. They are not separate. We are separating them because we cannot spend lifetime for applied research or fundamental research. So, applied research leads into fundamental research. Fundamental research leads into applied research. Okay? So, I will now go over to Nashik. the KK Wag Institute, Nasik. Okay, sir. So, my question is for the uh, heat exchanger uh, where counter flow is taking place and if you are changing the diameter of inner pipe, so then how to analyze such heat transfer means what will be the effect on heat transfer than conventional pipe in pipe heat exchanger? See, what we are doing is what the question is in a counter flow heat exchanger tube in tube heat exchanger, if I increase the diameter of the inner pipe, what will be its influence of its performance? First thing, what is happening? If I increase the diameter of the inner pipe, what is happening? The pressure drop of the inner side is decreasing, number one. If I assume that the mass flow rate is same, what will happen to my Reynolds number? 4m dot divided by pi d mu, my Reynolds number will come down. If my Reynolds number will come down, the Nusselt number, that is the heat transfer coefficient on the inner side will come down. But let us see what happens on the outer side. On the outer side, what is happening? Imagining that your outer diameter is constant and I have increased the outer diameter of the inner pipe, what is happening? My flow area on the annulus has decreased. So, velocity has increased for the same mass flow rate. Reynolds number has now increased because of which the heat transfer coefficient on the outer side will increase. Perhaps pressure drop will definitely decrease. So, pressure drop will increase. So, what is happening? What is whatever positive thing was happening on the inner side, now that has got shifted to the annular side. So, perhaps the effect will be more or less same, but I will not conclude. Why? Because you will have to sit down and calculate this to get the exact feel of the numbers. But by and large, overall feel you get is that not much effect would be there on the area of the heat exchanger. Only one thing is if the, uh, if the circuit is thermally imbalanced, if one side is very high heat transfer coefficient and the other was very low, your overall heat transfer coefficient would be lower than the lower of the two. So now if you have increased one of them and reduced the other, the imbalance has gotten reduced. So your overall heat transfer coefficient probably will increase a little bit and that would help in reduction of the area. But that is again problem specific uh, uh, situation it why cannot be generalized why don't you sit down why don't why don't you sit down and calculate this because it's not out of the world already one example is there just change the diameter put this in excel sheet and plot all the graphs you will get the area of the heat exchanger how it is varying so now you start thinking how are the parametrics affecting the performance of the heat exchanger uh, it may be a good idea to put a similar question in the test at uh, 2 o'clock <laughs> This is what we do often in IIT, by the way. Some discussion takes place in the last lecture of the course, and two days later in the NSEM, you'll find a large 10 mark question only on, uh, on, on that particular discussion. And those who did not attend the last lecture would suffer horribly. <laughs> there is uh, Government College Salem. Let's go over to Government College Salem. Sir, in studying radiation uh, through electromagnetic waves, so whether uh, what type of uh, wave motion uh, we can able to study about it? Whether uh, longitudinal or axisymmetric or flexural, torsional, whether uh, something can be connected to that? See, you, the waves general, the question is, the electromagnetic waves which are studying in radiation, are they longitudinal or various other cases you have taken? Let me cut short that question. Let me say that generally these waves are transverse waves. Generally these waves are transverse waves. Okay, that would be the answer, shortest possible answer I can think of. But whatever I taught yesterday was all through modest. There is an initial discussion in thermal radiative heat transfer, radiative heat transfer by modest about this longitudinality and the transverseness itself. Initially, people were thinking that these waves are longitudinal, but later on they realized that they are transverse. Okay? Okay, sir, one more question, sir. Okay. Uh, as a thermal 
thermal radiation is being discussed throughout, sir. Whether can you just uh, flash some points about uh, atomic or uh, nuclear radiation? Question is, you have only focused on thermal radiation. You are not focused on nuclear radiation. Professor, first thing, I don't know what is nuclear radiation. Okay? So, that is not the answer. The answer is, what are we looking at? The thermal aspects. This course is all about heat transfer. So, that's why we said, always when I used radiation, I used the term thermal radiation. The qualitative, sorry, the adjective what I need to use for radiation is thermal radiation. Definitely, we are not covering nuclear radiation at all because nuclear, nuclear radiation doesn't come under the purview of thermal radiation. That's what I emphasized when we studied Planck's distribution. The Planck's distribution is all about thermal radiation. By virtue of temperature, whatever radiation is taking place is thermal radiation. Nuclear radiation, that is X-rays and gamma rays are not under our purview. Okay? I have a question. Again, as a mundane observer, not associated with this, I would submit that whenever there is a nuclear radiation, there has to be an accompanying thermal radiation because of nuclear radiation. Yes. So, it may perhaps not be completely correct to say that nuclear radiation is outside our purview, yes. but perhaps the right thing would be to say that while nuclear radiation itself may not be in our purview, any thermal radiation resulting out of nuclear radiation is certainly of concern. Definitely. This is a good pointer what Professor Fatek has told. In fact, we always we said no, we cannot actually differentiate things. We need to take them in an integral sense. Yes, actually that's what in uh, nuclear application, this is called as neutronics and thermal hydraulic aspects. Neutronics and thermal hydraulic aspects cannot be separated. Actually, they have, to take a, they have to be taken together. In fact, what was happening in Fukushima? Fukushima, what was happening? Neutron activity was going up. What were they trying to do? They were trying to take the water from the sea and pump in water into the Fukushima nuclear reactor containment. What was happening? It is actually both neutron activity and the thermal hydraulics. Neutron, because of neutron activity, there is increase in the temperature. Someone has to take out the heat transfer. That high temperature. Who is trying to take it out? The water. The, the least possible thing one can do is to pour water. Actually, I need to spray water, but I cannot do because it is an emergency. I have to just take water from the ship and pour it because I don't have motors and pumps because there is no electricity there. I am just using my ship which is sitting far away and pouring water onto that. How effective it was? Only time will tell because we don't know. People are indeed sitting and studying the thermal hydraulic and the neutronic aspects. They feed into each other. They, we cannot separate them out. Professor is right. But we have not taught you neutronics. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from SVNIT. This will be the last question that we would take. Over to you, SVNIT. Uh, I'm always wondering uh, about the word term that NTU, number of transfer unit. So, can you please elaborate this term NTU because as we see the NTU definition, it includes overall uh, resistance, surface area and seaming. So, if we eliminate the fluid properties and the wall thickness, the only term which is representing the NTU is the surface area. So, this term was introduced because of the uh, number of heat transfer units will be uh, incorporated to increase the heat transfer okay the question is what is to put it short what is the physical significance of ntu uh Himan, just one clarification this ntu is a name given to something which refers to the dimension size so okay number of transfer units probably the it's uh, the name is what is bothering it, it just refers to the surface area associated with heat transfer so, whether it, you call it number of transfer units or uh, area term, it does not matter. Now, uh, you said that you take away the conduction, etc. What is NT, What is that NTU? What is that we are looking? In fact, why did we get to NTU? Let me ask Hemant. You always wonder, I know. Uh, but what is that we are doing for NTU? Why did we introduce NTU? Why did we introduce NTU? NTU because we wanted to get the relations for the heat transfer load in terms of area. Remember, in NTU method, unlike in LMTD approach, we know the area. In LMTD approach, 
we didn't know the area we had to figure out the heat exchanger area but in ntu method we know the area that's why the area is there in ntu so having known the area what would be my heat exchanger performance if i have to quantify that that has to be done in terms of the known parameter which is ntu that is area ntu for all practical purposes we can think that as area that is why we say if ntu is large size of my heat exchanger is large if ntu is less size of the heat exchanger is less provided as you rightly said u that is the resistance is same and m dot cp that is the mass flow rate into specific heat of the fluid is same okay in fact that is why see you have a given heat exchanger of a given dimension you are calculating the performance how good it is and suppose you uh, decrease the length by half in fact in that convection 5 the slides it was told double the length you could get na uh, almost 90 99% of performance so what we are trying to say is this increase in the surface area does not translate to a corresponding similar increase in the performance so performance evaluation is possible because of this non dimensional term called nt which is nothing but a representative area i would call it you probably usefulness of this exchanger or something maybe that is what it is okay thank you sir in addition to my question uh, is it based on experimental or pure proposed theory ntu is it obtained experimentally or see ntu ntu is not coming out experimentally what is that we are looking for we are writing an equation for effectiveness effectiveness is a function of ntu and ratio of the specific heat why ratio of the specific heat that depend that decides my temperature gradient okay and ntu decides my area so professor arun has been insisting whether it is heat exchangers or fins or constant wall temperature constant heat flux boundary condition in case of convection all the time the driving force the driving potential in heat transfer is the temperature difference so the effectiveness is a function of ntu and ratio of the specific heat how did we get this we have derived this from fundamentals and these derived things have been found over experience but that they are going to be near nearer to the experimental results they are not very much off within the experimental uncertainty is that okay hemant yeah yeah sir Very good. It's over, sir. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.